Jerusalem is now David's city, a new center of power for the Israelites, and a home for the ultimate symbol of their bond with God. The Ark of the Covenant! Your wife's far too pretty for you, my friend. You're right. Majesty, <laughs> come. You don't mind, you're right. I mind. <laughs> Your Majesty. Ah, oh, Prophet. Look, my temple for the Ark for the Lord. The world's never seen anything like it. The Lord came to me last night. He's pleased with our work. The Lord told me the house of David will rule Israel forever. We are blessed. Your son will be king. Your son will build the temple. My temple. God's temple. God's temple. A kingdom forever. Thank you, Nathan. Your Majesty, as you requested. Leave us. Bathsheba. Majesty. David. Is there news of my husband? No. No, nothing like that. He's safe enough, I believe, although he is far away. Fighting the enemy. But you didn't go. No need. Not with men like Uriah to do it for me. I am loyal to my husband. about your king. This is wrong.
Bathsheba becomes pregnant. God's chosen king breaks his commandments. Uriah, my friend. Welcome. You sent for me, Majesty. How's the war going? Well, very well. And your commander, Joab, all is well with him? All is well. A fellow of soldiers. They fight well. Excellent. Well, you can give me a fuller report in the morning. I'm sure for now you'd rather be with your wife. <sighs> I cannot stay with my wife. Of course you can. While my men are camped in open country, fighting the enemy, this is a holy war. How could I go to my home and spend the night with my wife? It does you credit, Uriah. But man to man, who's to know? I will know. Good man. I'd like to drink. Wine! David cannot force Uriah to sleep with Bathsheba. So he finds another way to conceal his adultery. Commander Joab, I order you to send Uriah to where the fighting is fiercest and abandon him there to die. You think you can just sweep what you've done under the carpet? You took everything from your most loyal servant, Uriah. He deserved your respect. I did respect him. Really? You took his wife, then you took his life. Prophet! You think God doesn't see everything? The Lord has spoken to me. He will bring disaster on your house for the contempt you have shown the Lord. No. No. He will take your son. We shall see. Tell me what to do. First my husband, now my son. We are cursed. But I was anointed. God blessed me. A king is never above his God. You were supposed to rule in his name, not your own. We're finished. Everyone will see that God has left us. <laughs> Prophet. 
Even though you are weak, he loves you, David. You have forged God's nation on earth. Take comfort in each other. You will have another son. <laughs> Be careful, Solomon. Let him play. It's the house of the Lord. One day he'll have to build it. Solomon will build God's temple. But like his father, you'll find it impossible to obey God's commandments. Well, good morning, everybody. Looking forward to continuing our series in the life of David these days. We're calling it Pursuit. Beg your indulgence with my voice. I've got a cold that's settled in my uh, throat. So, um, yeah, just your patience, and Mickey and I will get through the day up here. We're, I'm confident of that. We arrive at that other uh, signature moment in David's life. You remember at the beginning of our series I said there are two uh, moments in his life that will really echo in eternity uh, in terms of what people through the ages will think about David. The first was with that oversized enemy warrior. Remember big ugly dude, Philistine, Goliath, David took him out, total victory. So while David could conquer that kind of an enemy, David could not conquer um, the sense of entitlement that developed in his heart as king and lust run amok and he could not overcome a gorgeous Hebrew woman. And we saw a little 10 minute video of that that really does quite a good job of summarizing 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12 and we're gonna look at those this morning. Now, this is a tragically uh, sad moment in David's life when he chooses to take another man's wife and it's really uh, another side of a heart after God. Uh, when he figuratively speaking was on his roof and he peeked out the window shade when he should not have and did what he should not have done. Uh, for David, it was a moment of pleasure, compromise, which led to a lifetime of pain and put in motion terrible, difficult consequences for the rest of his days. But I don't want to talk just about David this weekend. I want to talk about us, you and me. Because everything going on in David's heart, good, bad, and ugly, also, I'm sure, happens in our hearts in some version or other, right? So I want us, while we're working through these verses today, I want to think about our humanity, our temptation, our redemption. And I want you to hear me well on this, everybody. How you and I can come out the other side and we can come out the other side in life when we've made stupid decisions, sinful decisions, selfish decisions. Life is not over if that's happened to you. Uh, when our hearts are repentant and we begin to realign our life with God's purposes and principles again, we can come out the other and to, sure, to be sure there will be scars. And based upon the gravity of our decision making, could be some ugly scars. But by God's grace, those scars can become beauty marks. And we can become people of wisdom, people that are fully healed, people uh, that have a sense of the emerging character of Christ in our lives. At Calvary Temple Church, we don't want to just be about truth. We want to be about grace equally. And the reason we want to do this is that's what the one we follow did. He said, Jesus speaking, that the law came through Moses. Grace and truth, both equally, came through Jesus. And so with an eye toward truth and an eye toward grace, uh, let's begin this three-weekend study of this David Bathsheba moment. Now this weekend, what we're going to do is we're going to work verse by verse very quickly through chapters 11 and 12, and then we're going to wrap up with five aspects of adultery that many of you may be unfamiliar with. Next week, we're going to talk about why we commit adultery, uh, the four big reasons that we see demonstrated in Scripture. Final week is how we can affair-proof our marriage. I think after these three weekends, if we're paying attention 
and our hearts have a sweet teachability to them, right? I think in the process we can build a healthier marriage relationship, each one of us, uh, in our lives. Now, speaking of marriage and relationship, I don't know if you've heard about Ed. Ed had a bad time last week, and uh, Ed was in trouble because he forgot his 25th wedding anniversary, and his wife was not happy with Ed. And so she comes to him and she says, Ed, tomorrow morning I expect a gift in our driveway that goes from zero to 200 in six seconds. And Ed, it better be there. Ed sort of gulps and the day passes. Next morning, Ed got up early, left for work. When his wife awakened, she looked out the window and there was a gift wrap box in the middle of the driveway. Confused, the wife put on a robe, ran out to the driveway, brought the box back into the house. She opened it, and there she found a brand new bathroom scale. (laughs) Some of you are very slow. (laughs) Now here's the problem, and I need your prayer in this. Ed has been missing since last Friday. (laughs) We cannot find Ed. Now, Just honestly speaking, right? I ain't the sharpest knife in the drawer. I think Ed should get from his wife at least a point or two for creativity. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Okay. See, I think that's very creative. Stupid, but creative. Take your Bibles, uh, would you please? And again, if you don't have hard copies, we have English, Spanish in the back, or your device, however it is that you uh, use Scripture. And let's work our way through chapters 11 and chapter 12. Verse 1, chapter 11. In the spring at the times when kings go off to war, David sent Joab uh, and the army out, but David remained in Jerusalem. Now here's one of the biggest questions people ask me. Hey John, did David intentionally stay behind to to seduce Bathsheba? I guess I'd ask you a question. What do you think? I mean really, most of the time for you and for me, Uh, aren't most of our bad decisions, even our sinful decisions, ones that we premeditate and calculate, right? And by the way, Bathsheba was no stranger to David. Her grandfather was one of David's chief spiritual counselors, Ahithophel. Her husband, Uriah, was one of David's mighty men. Remember all the cave-dwelling years where David was a fugitive in the wilderness running for his life? Uriah was there the whole time. He knew exactly who Bathsheba was, and he thought she was hot, and I think it is very quite possibly David stayed behind in the city in the spring at the time when kings go out to war for precisely that purpose. Now, you'll notice in verse number two of chapter 11, this rooftop living thing. Now, that's kind of a different deal for us in America because, you know, we have peaked roofs, and you don't really live up there. In Israel, a roof is like another room in the house. You could sleep up there on hot nights. Uh, You could take your meals up there. I mean, it's just another room of the house. And we know from archaeological digs in the original city of David, uh, which is just a fraction of what the city of Jerusalem was at its peak, uh, it was actually on a hillside. So that where David's palace was, was at the top, he had an expansive bird's eye view, not just of Bathsheba's home but of all the homes. And it was done that way, not obviously for that purpose, but for also military purpose and military strategy and so. So he's on the rooftop when he peaked. Check out verse three. She makes her emergence, her name is Bathsheba, and she is a godly woman, and we know this, because the meaning of her name is daughter of the oath. Now, in America, we pick names because they sound cute or cool or they rhyme or they go well with our last name. In Israel, you pick names with profound spiritual meaning, and she comes from a great godly lineage, and she was a daughter of the oath. She was a young woman consecrated to God, and here's the deal. For seducing this daughter of the oath, David breaks his own oath with God. He breaks his own oath with his wives, and Uh, He also caused her to break her oath with God and her oath to her husband, Uriah. Now, among the many things that these two chapters are, they are a cautionary tale. Do you know what I mean by that? You might be saying in your heart, John, 
This is David we're talking about here. How could he do something so stupid? Here's, at least in part, how I think he could, and you and me too. I think the danger for those of us that have had some experience as Christ followers, what happens in our hearts and in our life is drift, and we find ourselves incidentally, almost accidentally, sometimes even unintentionally running red lights. That's what happens with drift. In other words, things that were once considered holy in our lives no longer command our obedience. Once upon a time, our oath with God was our bottom line. Now the red lights in our lives have faded only to yellow caution lights. And if we are not careful, we'll eventually become green lights of license. Especially when we're winning big. Especially when we think we're successful. Especially when all the instrument gauges of our lives are up, 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 and we seem to be winning, and we seem to uh, just kind of have the magic touch. It seems to have happened to David, a careless, flippant sort of sense of entitlement. I am the king. I am God's chosen. I will do what I want. Look at verse 4. It says that he slept with her. Now, that phrase, he slept with her, is unique because in Hebrew language, there are, there's more than one way to talk about marital relations between a man uh, and a woman, and this is not the normal Hebrew word for loving intimacy of a married couple. Uh, it is a, a word speaking of the sexual act that is really violent, bordering on rape. It is the exact same Hebrew word that we find in the book of Genesis when Noah's daughter seduced her drunken dad. It's the exact same word we find in chapter 13 of the very same book, 2 Samuel, when Amnon raped Tamar. It's the exact same word we find when Potiphar's wife uh, was hot and heavy after Joseph, okay? So it is an act of violence. I think it is um, fair to say a couple things. First of all, Bathsheba was largely, if not completely, innocent. And secondly, that David, godly David, has crossed the line and is losing control. Check out verse five. Have you asked yourself, I have, how did Bathsheba feel? Her only words, interestingly in this whole narrative, are only three in number. I am pregnant. For some of you, those, probably for most of us, tremendously joyous words in our life, but if it's not what we planned, they could have been very scary words. For her, they were horror-filled. And so now the only recourse would be some kind of cover-up, and that quickly ensues. But how did Bathsheba feel? Because there is an emotional backstory here. Uh, certainly she was terrified, certainly she felt used, certainly she felt abandoned. And by the way, she's gotta know that her husband Uriah is back in town. The city of David was not that big of a city and people talk. Before Facebook, people yacked a lot. It's called gossip. And of course, they're just sharing prayer requests, but it's gossip. And everybody knew what the king had done. Now Uriah comes in the town, and the first night he slept at the king's door. And so I'm sure with the other guards, soldiers, interacting with the people of his community and not going home to see his wife, whispers are abounding in the city of David. And he has got to know. And she, innocent woman though she was, may be have hoping that even Uriah would come home and spend the night with her to give her some context of covering over her horror, right? So in verse six, look at it. This is where the cover-up begins, and David, uh, in desperation, gets in way over his head and takes sin to a whole new level. Look at verse number eight. Uriah now returns to the capital at David's summons. Now look at me, everybody. What we have, most of you in your mind, may have all these events of these two chapters compressed into less than a week. This went on for weeks and probably months. Remember, Uriah is away in a battlefield. And so what you would have to do is send a messenger, which probably took many days, maybe a full week, to get to the battlefield. Then there are hundreds of thousands of guys. You gotta find Uriah. And then he's got to leave his command, and he's got to journey the many days or a week back. So enough time has passed that Bathsheba knows I am pregnant. Uriah is now in town. He comes before David. Your majesty, you summon me. 
How's the war going? All this pretense, small talk. And then David said, I'm glad you're home. Go ahead and go home and spend the night uh, with your wife. Now, it's interesting if you look at verse number eight, it says, and he sent after Uriah a gift from the king. Do you know what that is? It's a romantic catered dinner uh, that he's sending home with Uriah to his wife to put the two of them in an amorous mood to complete the cover up. You know what I'm talking about, see? How many of you, by the way, yesterday was Valentine's. Don't any of you guys look at me with shock on your face. Yesterday was Valentine's. I hope you had a romantic, catered meal together. And by the way, guys, I hope you paid. Just saying. Okay, look at verse number 11. It's now the second day in Jerusalem from the battlefront. Almost certainly Uriah knows now that David has just ruthlessly deceived him. Because in verse 11, this is not just a statement of principle that Uriah makes to the king, it's almost an accusation. And you see that clearly in the original Hebrew. Check it out. Uriah said to David, the ark in Israel and Judah are staying on in tents. My master Jove and my Lord's men are camped in the open fields. How could I go to my house and eat and drink and lie with my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. What is conspicuous by its absence in verse 11, he, there's no statement of respect toward David because normally you'd wrap it up and say, my Lord the King or your majesty or something like that. That is an accusation. And you know when there is mischief afoot in some relationship. Uriah, you know, he's not that dumb. And now he knows, and David knows that he knows, and things are getting tense. Now, it's interesting that this despised Gentile, Uriah, this Hittite, this one that is not one of the chosen, uh, is more virtuous than the man after God's own heart himself. Verses 12 to 15. David's now lobbing a Hail Mary. It's his last ditch attempt to get Uriah home with his wife, so this time, gonna get him drunk. Doesn't work again, so now David conceives a plot to have Uriah murdered. And in verses 16 to 26, we see the adultery come full flower, we see murder, we see cruel cover-up, we see infamy, infamy, and we see coming judgment, which brings me to verse 27. I want you to look very closely at verse 27 of chapter 11, the last sentence. Because you know what's conspicuous by its absence in all of chapter 11 up to this point? God is not mentioned. But now, God is mentioned. Because David, king that he was, thought that no one was looking. God was. Check it out, last verse, verse 27. But the thing... David had done, displeased the Lord. Say that with me, everybody. But the thing David had done, displeased the Lord. In verse 12, or rather chapter 12 now, we're not gonna go verse by verse, but I wanna just sort of unpack a few insights that will complete our story we uh, meet somebody called Nathan. He is God's prophet, and he is really a priest slash prophetic voice in David's life for right, for wrong, for the leading of God as king. He confronts David with devastating judgment, tells him a little parable about an unjust, wealthy, influential man, and Nathan points his finger and says, you are that man. See, that spiritual drift in David's life, he's been busted because David had forgotten what God had done for him, and now he's mostly remembering what he, David, had done for himself. Uh, and it's so easy for you and I, at the top of our game, to begin to believe in our own press, our own wisdom, our own power, our own infallibility, and that's the kind of drift that seems to have happened in David's life, some kind of an impervious entitlement mentality. It's almost like he begins to believe in the David brand, the magic formula, sprinkle a little fairy dust because God's anointings upon me. I can do whatever I want. And this time, the David brand will not cover up. He says, you are the man. You struck down Uriah the Hittite. 
You took his wife to be your own in verse number nine. Now here's the charge. Look at it with me in verse number 14. He says, you despised the Lord or showed contempt for the Lord by doing evil in his eyes. Is this the David who's now despising and showing contempt for God? That word means carelessness or recklessness. That's the charge, and it is true. Now notice verse number 11, go back up. Do you see what's gonna happen upon David's house? Calamity will come upon David, his family, and his kingdom, and his reign. One of the verses in the Bible, in the New Testament, that's pretty insightful, it says, don't be deceived, God's not mock. Whatsoever we sow, that will we also reap. Now, how did David cover up his sexual immorality? He had a man murdered. And how did he do that? By the sword. He has Joab take Uriah into the fiercest place in the battlefield. All the other Israeli soldiers uh, withdraw, and Uriah is hung out the dry, and he dies at the sword of the enemy. Now, what does Nathan say to David? Calamity will come upon your house. The sword will never leave your home. What we sow, we reap. What we give away, we get back. And we see that happening now. I would caution all of us, beware that you ever raise a sword. Now, as we follow along in this passage, we see that David finally, only after he's busted in verse 13, confesses, he says, I have sinned against the Lord. His great prayer of repentance is recorded for posterity in Psalm 51. We'll study that a few weekends from now. Psalm 51. The son that Bathsheba conceived by David dies. David takes Bathsheba to be his own wife now. That's just what he needs. Another wife to add to all of his other wives. Uriah is dead and gone. She gets pregnant again. Now, in an act that is just a raw act of mercy and grace, this child, Solomon, will be the king to succeed his father and the one to build the great temple in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. Interesting about Solomon, he's also the one that would have the same moral weakness as his dad, only much, much worse. In other words, let me put it to you this way. What parents excuse in moderation, children will live in excess. Let me put it to you this way. The morals that one generation tolerates, the next will live. That informs all of us to be very careful about the conduct of our lives, the word of our mouth, the deeds of our days, because little eyes are watching us. Don't worry that our children aren't listening to us. Worry that they're watching us. And they will once upon a time emulate our character. Okay, a few key insights to summarize this piece of our Bible study. When we arrive at this tragic moment in chapter 11 and 12 of 2 Samuel, David is no longer a teenage fugitive on the run. He is now a secure monarch. He is at the height of his powers, the zenith of empire. He is reclining in triumph. Um, he is a man at the top of his game. He's deep in the comforts of middle age, comfortably sconced in his palace. This sexual indulgence that we read about here in chapters 11 and 12 uh, becomes a massive blot of infamy against the previous flawless legacy of David. It brings devastating consequence. David's life before the Bathsheba moment had been up, 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 blessing after blessing, victory after victory. From the Bathsheba moment forward, it was down, 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 down. I'm not sure what to make of it. I'm just pointing it out. For David, lust became a gateway sin that led to coveting and stealing, lying, adultery, and murder. In other words, a gateway sin that opened the door to all the fellow sins. Now, apparently David thought it was a trivial matter to take the wife and the life of a Gentile, a Hittite for pity's sake. 
not one of God's chosen, so to speak, not one of God's people. And David thought it a trivial matter. Now, it's interesting, Uriah, as you may know now, was listed as one of David's mighty men. So all the desert wandering years, dwelling in caves, Uriah was there faithfully by his commander's side, probably saved David's life, many times protected David's life with his own life makes it especially a a horrid betrayal. But here's another interesting thing. Do you know what Uriah's name means? Hittite though he was. It means the Lord, Yahweh, is my light. Uh, You, in biblical times, gave great spiritual meaning to names, as I just mentioned. Almost certainly this Hittite, Uriah, was a convert to the God of Israel. He was a convert to Judaism. David was not just killing, so to speak, a reviled Philistine. David was killing a brother. His most intimate of friends, maybe beyond Jonathan, Uriah would be in the top three or the top five. It was an unspeakable betrayal. Um, It's interesting to note that God harshly condemns David's sin against this Hittite. In this passage in chapter 12 in the encounter with Nathan, it's interesting that much more emphasis is placed, David, you killed Uriah, rather than David, you slept with Bathsheba. Because murder is the weightier of the two sins. The ultimate sin, the ultimate offense in the eyes of God is a premeditated killing of a human life. And that's exactly what David's done. Now, God raised up Israel beginning with the godly Abraham, not to exploit the nations, but to be what? A light to the nations. Now it breaks my heart because this tender-hearted, lovable, passionate, courageous, anointed man that we have come to love, David, um, he topples off his pinnacle of blessing. He ends up breaking, did you notice, half the Ten Commandments. If you were to check out the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20 and just take a quick glance at the last five, watch this. Do not commit murder. In reference to what David has done, check. Do not commit adultery, check. Do not steal, check. Do not give false testimony against your neighbor, check. Do not covet your neighbor's wife, check. Check. how the mighty have fallen. What drift lay, not just in David's heart, as godly as he was, but in my heart and in yours. That we need to have a constant awareness of our vulnerability, of our our fallibility. That we have appropriate boundaries and parameters and accountability and commitments that will guide our life in the way of the favor and blessing of God. Because we make the choices, but the consequences are built in. We can't pick the consequences. We can only pick the choices, the decisions. I can still remember uh, our oldest daughter, Caitlin, um, we loved to- Toy Story growing up. And do you remember Mrs. Potato Head? Make good choices. You know, when Mr. Potato Head, I, Caitlin would do that all the time, say to her siblings, make good choices. It's all about choices. Remember, we're not a product of our circumstances. We're a product of our choices, and our choices create our circumstances. Is that fair? You say, well, John, what are the consequences? Even though God loved David, even though God did forgive David, David put into motion some devastating, irretrievable circumstances. If you go to the very next chapter, chapter 13, this is what we'll find. Two of David's children, Amnon and Tamar, by two different of David's wives. So they're a half-brother and sister. Amnon rapes Tamar. So we have rape and we have incest. Is Nathan's prophetic judgment coming true? But it doesn't end there. If you go to the next chapter, chapter 14, we meet David's favorite son, Absalom. Handsome, dynamic, charismatic, beautiful head of hair. I hate him for that. And David's favorite son, and probably in the minds of the people, the obvious heir apparent. Absalom was the full brother of beautiful Tamar, who was raped. 
in a revenge murder, Absalom kills Amnon. And then Absalom takes it a step further and rebels against his father and the government in place and commits a coup d'etat and runs his own father, the great David, out of Jerusalem at the tip of spear. And then brings untold death, destruction, civil war, unbelievable pain. Remember, we make the choices. The consequences are built in. It's what the poet said. What a destructive web we weave when at first we practice to deceive. Let's leave the text for a few moments and wrap up with some thoughts about sex. Really, I want to talk about sex. Now, some of you, your palms just got sweaty, your mouth went dry, and you said, John can't possibly be doing this. Oh, yeah. And here's why. We should not be ashamed to talk about what God was not ashamed to create. We'll do it tastefully. We'll do it with humility, integrity, with a, in a biblical mindset. The Bible teaches that God created sex as a beautiful gift for a husband and wife, for one flesh union, for pleasure, for fun, and for children. And then God gave us something equally as wonderful. He created the only healthy, healthy environment um, guilt-free environment whereby we can express our legitimate uh, sexual needs and desires, and it's called marriage. And that's what God is always after, safeguarding marriage and the family. Now, let me read you the story of Martha. It's very short, because this is a sort of microcosm of what's happening in the 21st century. Martha went to a luncheon in a major city with 10 other women, and during the conversation, one woman boldly asked the others how many had been faithful to their husbands for the duration of their marriages. Only one woman raised her hand, Martha told her husband later. She hung her head, and it wasn't me. But I have been faithful to you, honey, she quickly added. Then why didn't you raise your hand, your husband asked. And Martha answered, because I was ashamed. There's almost an associated shame or humiliation or awkwardness with choosing to do, not in an arrogant way, but quietly, the right thing, the good thing, um, the correct thing in God's eyes. Uh, statistically, adultery in the United States, every statistical survey I've had access to says that about half of all married men and women will at some point commit adultery in their marriage relationship. Um, some even say that men may be as high as two-thirds the tragedy is, it appears not to differ statistically that much in the church. And I say to you with love, that ought not be. Now, let me add additionally, the whole issue of emotional affairs, while not explicitly sexual in nature, when someone else is meeting needs in your life that only your spouse should be meeting, that is a danger spot. Get out of Dodge. Probably for every married person in this room, in this church, in this East Bay, everywhere, there's probably someone that most of us could fall in love with that we're not married to, okay? Uh, it doesn't make us bad people, it makes us people. And what we need to do is we need to be deeply committed to the truth of Scripture, to doing what is right in God's eyes, and as I mentioned earlier, appropriate accountability and communication and all the vital things to keep our life in a safe place, in a secure place. Because if it can happen to David, it can happen to each one of us. Because the good, the bad, the ugly in him is the same kinds of inclinations which rest in our hearts. J. Allen Peterson said a call for fidelity in the 21st century is like a voice crying in the wilderness. What was once adultery and carried the stigma of guilt and embarrassment now is an affair. Nice sounding, inviting word wrapped in mystery, fascination, excitement. It's a relationship, not sin. What was once behind the scenes, a secret closely guarded, is now in the headlights, a TV theme, a bestseller, as common as the cold. Marriages are open and divorces are creative. I note with interest that during this February Valentine season, uh, that movie, Fifty Shades of Grey, has come out. And it made tens of millions of dollars the opening weekend. And I say to you, not with arrogance, not with finger pointing, not with Mr. Good, to, to, 
goody two-shoes self-righteous. I'm simply saying that kind of stuff ought not be part of our lives because there's no way that we can make ourselves immune from what enters our eyes, gets into our soul, gets into our spirit, gets into our life, and we need to be discerning, not religiously pretentious, but simply say, you know what? This thing I will not do. Boom, and we walk away. Now, I want to add here that if you are a divorced or remarried person uh, in this church, you are not a second-class citizen, and I want to say that very gently. Uh, We simply, uh, in our church, raise the bar of biblical standards for God's best for our lives. Jesus came, and he said, Moses brought the law, but I come, and I bring you truth and grace. Remember, both are equally important. All truth without grace is legalism, and all grace without truth is a life of serious spiritual and moral compromise. It's truth and grace, and we want to be a family of believers, not perfect people, but growing and becoming, that are deeply committed to biblical truth and equally deeply committed to biblical grace. And that's why we say that if you have in any way failed in your lives, your life isn't over. God is a gracious God. Will there be scars? Yes, it breaks my heart to tell you. Almost certainly there will be. But God has not discarded you. God is not throwing you away. God is not done with you. As long as we have a repentant heart and a desire to once again recommit our lives to him. So the Bible teaches that God created them male and female. God created sex. He said it's not good for man to be alone. But after the fall, a divine drive became a dangerous urge, and love became lust. And that's the mood of our day to this day. Obey your instincts. Do what comes natural. If it feels good, do it. Ask yourself the question, why did David really need another wife? He already had a bunch of pretty wives. Do you really need one more? That informs us about the nature of lust. With lust for anything, not just sexuality, money, materialism, uh, you know, whatever, fame, enough is never enough. And it points to a nagging internal deficit that we're not dealing with ultimate issues internally with God. Lust is an over-desire that God never intended. And if we give our lives over to that in any venue in our lives, enough will never be enough. And so David took yet one more pretty woman that he was not allowed to. So I understand in our day that saying stuff like this is woefully out of touch, but I'm already this far in. Bear with me a few more moments. I want to suggest to you that the new morality is only the old immorality I want to suggest to you that the safe sex of our day is the free love of the 60s. And by the way, can I say also, now let's think here for a moment. I want to suggest to you that there is no such thing as free love. First of all, it's not free. It's tragically costly, and it will cost us more than we ever intended to pay. And then, secondly, it is not love. It is lust. Now, I believe that we live in some sense in a self-hurt culture that says if I can't feel significant, at least I can feel good. And so we hop into bed after bed, relationship after relationship, but what we really need to fill the gaping hole in our soul is not that. Because there's no goods in the material realm of this life, sexually, financially, vocationally, or any other realm that can ultimately meet the deepest yearnings of the human soul. Did you know that God created safe sex? Let me tell you, because not only did he create the beautiful gift of sex, he created guilt-free, joyful sex with abandon. And here's his biblical life-giving strategy. Abstinence before marriage, faithfulness within marriage. Now some of you are looking at me saying, John, are you on drugs? Right, that's going to work. Hey, I didn't say it was going to be popular. I just said it's going to be truthful. Let me say it again. 
abstinence before marriage, fidelity, faithfulness within marriage. Okay, let me put it to you this way. So I've had the tremendous privilege to be a pastor for a bunch of years. Do you know what I've never yet met once? Not once. I've never yet been introduced to a happy adulterer. Now think about that for a minute. Let's be real. I've never met an adulterer that says, whoa, I'm just in multiple adulterous affairs, John, and it's rocking awesome. No, they come in, they're crawling, sobbing, weeping. She left me, took all my money and my cat. You know, their life is falling apart. They lost their job, they lost their credibility. Who knows what else happened? So when I say I haven't met a happy adulterer, when we live outside God's moral parameters, when we live with tremendous guilt, guilt is a good thing that will guide us back to God. So here's the truth. God's truth does not change because we change. So the Bible cautions us for our good to safeguard marriage and family that sexuality is for the beautiful confines of matrimony. When we live outside that ideal, we invite guilt, marriage destruction, ruins our children, venereal infection, pregnancy, abortion, and you fill in the blanks. For a moment of pleasure, we invite a lifetime of pain. And America continues to buy into the myth of the greener grass. Now, I'm just a farm boy at my heart, so I'm just going to say this. The grass is greener on the other side of the pasture because there's more manure over there. (laughs) It's the truth, dude. I'm telling you. If you want green grass, water it. Water where you are. Your problem, or my problem, is not a new mate. Our problem is heart transformation. And so we learn these things from David's life. Fill in these five real quick and we gotta wrap up. So the Bible does teach that adultery is sin. And number one, it's a sin against God. Fill it in, God. Psalm 51, David got it right, his great repentance psalm when he said against you, O God, and you only have I sinned. Secondly, it's a sin against our spouse and children. Thirdly, it's a sin against our own body. A lot of people don't know this, but the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6 that all other sins a person commits are outside their body, but he who sins, or she who sins sexually, sins against their own body body. And so the reminder there is to flee sexual immorality and temptation. Fourthly, it's a sin against the church body. Do you know that how we live affects everybody else in the room? What you do affects me. What I do affects you. What you do affects each other. We are all in this together. And do you know what's at stake among other things? The reputation of Jesus Whatever we do, let's not trample on the reputation of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the one that brought us grace and truth. Number five, it's a sin against the other person. Not only do we bring painful consequence in our life, we invite painful consequence in their life as well. Ending on this positive, why does God say, my children, because I love you, please, Do not commit adultery because God wants to protect and safeguard our highest earthly relationship, marriage and family. Because when we say no to non-marital sex, we are saying yes to something far more important and far better. We'll talk more next weekend. Would you stand to your feet, please? I do apologize about my voice. Got to just get through one more, so thank you for your kind patience. Uh, Very quickly, if you need to talk to somebody about where you are spiritually, on both sides of the platform, we have an area called I Raised My Hand. We're available without judgment to listen and to love you. For those of you that are guests with us and you just have a few sort of general questions about the church and you just want to find out some stuff, Our servant leaders will be available. 
over in these rooms off to this side of the campus immediately following this service. When you leave, I want to encourage you to engage in two things, and you can register online for both of these. Membership class with Carrie and myself, and then our spring small group run-up. Let's, uh, let's do life together. Remember, if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. Let's go together, because we're better together. Let's pray. The only thing we really can pray, God, um, as we studied chapter 11 and chapter 12 this morning of 2 Samuel is what David cried in Psalm 51 when he repented. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Cast us not away, nor take your Holy Spirit from us. And so God, search us and know us. Help us understand who we really are and who we're really becoming and what you desire us to become. May there be much grace in lives that feel very broken here today. May they not walk out defeated and guilt-laden. May they walk out feeling your life-giving, forgiving grace, but equally your life-giving truth because now we do understand how we can walk in a way that invites your favor upon our lives. Thank you for your love for us in Jesus' name. And everyone said, I love you so much. See you next weekend.